It's several months later and we've made a ton of improvements and additions, one in the form of a new employee. This is Carlos Acosta. He is the chief problem solver and improver here at Pearson Work Holding. So this is what has changed. If you remember our UMC video series, the, the VF2C is now here. We're closest to our training room. We had to move that here. The UMC went there. This is an autonomous work cell. So it just runs. We, don't, we wanted it as far away from the other machines so that we could just let it do its thing and we concentrate our workforce in a more condensed area over on that side of the shop. So Carlos came in and, um, and you made a ton of improvements. Let's talk through that. What is this? Well, I have a wonderful electronic invention I want you to see. It, it looks something like this. This entire piece here is, a, is a, a table that allows the entire robot system to be consolidated into one point. The original setup had the robot bolted to the ground. It was fixed um, and it had cables running up under the machine. It mm -hmm. had a whole bunch of things on the back of the machine. I wanted all of that brought to a single Point. Everything that's related to the robot is is right here, and uh, you know as I've started to program the machine, it's already clear that having all of these things at my fingertips and the ability to make on-the-fly changes mm -hmm. is uh, is a very big improvement for sure. So before, if you guys remember, we had the robot bolted to a pedestal. That's kind of a permanent installation. The next step is to move this to one of our lathes for tending the lathe. But then we thought, do we get another pedestal? What happens? What do we do with that pedestal when it's just a, a, a doing a setup? The robot is always in the way. So that was one of the things we came up with. This is a, a, a welded steel table from Uline. A uh, few hundred dollars, maybe like $300. And it's heavy. So when you hold our largest pallet way out here and it's 51 inch reach, it doesn't tip over. So the other thing is we, we had almost our controls were spread out. So we had the robot control box at the back of the machine, the pendant running up to the front, mm -hmm. all the sensors, pneumatics, uh, actuators, all that was at the back. So we were kind of, it was, we were splitting our attention between the front of the machine and the back of the machine and cables and wires going all over. Right. Let's talk about that right down there. That's, uh, I think, a, that my favorite improvement. Yeah, the, the, the pneumatic control. It, this is a standard uh, industrial control uh, enclosure and it, that you buy them with a, a, a blank back plane that's mm -hmm. kind of off the back. You can drill your own holes, drill, mm -hmm. drill uh, the holes in the side. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, all of, all of this on the side, um, I, I, I hope I have a photo of this. Uh -huh. um, of uh, when, when it was cut? When we were machining this, it was, it was quite a party. We do. Uh, <laughs> Go to Instagram, Pearson underscore work holding. Scroll back, you're gonna see our cutting edge work holding. Is it, are we gonna turn it into a product? It's still on the fence, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you, you'll get a kick out of the amazing way that we held this. Uh, we'll put a link in the description below, but let's crack it open. What's inside? All right. So what we have here is uh, uh, a, a terminal block up here at the top. This takes the electrical signals at the very tip top. Now, for the most part, I wanted to keep the electrical stuff as far away from anything that, that could get um, any, any fluids or anything in here. So that stays uh, up here at the top. And this is a bank of uh, four uh, just one-way pneumatic valves. And this is a two-way pneumatic valve right here. Okay, first of all, the two-way, that does the auto door. Because right. the piston needs to be pushed open and retracted closed. Sure. We have one line that goes to... Oh, our vacuum power unit. Yeah, there's a VPU here in the bottom. Okay, that's always left on. And that's always that left on. That goes to the vacuum, uh, yep. the uh, end of arm vacuum cup. Right. Um, the next one, what does that go to? Uh, three of these are unused at the moment. Okay. And the intention of the other three is primarily as blow off valves. Okay, that's right. So uh, if there's uh, chips or anything like that on something. These are the um, the ones that would control that. Mm -hmm. um, there's also um, 
uh, we, it's, there's, there might be an application where we would need an additional vacuum generator. Okay, yeah. yeah. We're not painting ourselves into a corner. We want more flexibility if the need arises someday because we need to stop thinking about just this machine. There's gonna be a lathe or another mill that we put this robot in front of, or even like we've talked about um, tending the saw. And so we'll, right. how, how many blow off nozzles do we need to uh, uh, properly clean off a sawn part that it picks up. So Yeah, well these can also control actuators. Mm. So like in the case of the saw or the lathe, we might need a solenoid or some kind of a pusher mm -hmm. to push something into position or, mm -hmm. or, so, or temporarily hold something there you go. Uh, that, that's not vacuum based. So we do have these uh, color coded. The, the red lines are for pressure and the blue is for uh, vacuum. And inside you saw that there were some yellow ones. Those mm -hmm. are intermediate interconnects. Mm. Um, and so anyway, so I know uh, right away that this is, a, this is a vacuum one, it's labeled vacuum A, but this one we can, we can pull this out and we could put some, you know, plug something else in there. We never had to open up the box, which is kind of nice. Mm -hmm. um, there are uh, controls on the inside to adjust the speed and the force that the, uh, that the auto door closes. And I didn't want people going in there, so I drilled these two holes right here, and you can stick in a screwdriver and make the little adjustments if the door is kind of slamming open or, or, or not. These are the speed controls for the so door. So we literally, once we get it dialed in and everything connected, close this, rarely will we ever have to even open this box, right. which is what we want. Yep. When you first get the robot set up with the, the control box of the robot, you wanna do your wiring, close it, almost go hide the key. Right. You don't want people in there. You ideally don't even want to go in there. That's right. That's Set it right. up once. Okay, that's And if fantastic. I do have to go in there, I did uh, put quite a bit of effort into labeling yeah, everything. Yeah, I noticed that everything um, is so well labeled. I'm so guilty sometimes of coming up with like this mad scientist plan that I get it to work and then I just run it. Next thing you know, I want to make a change. I don't know what is what and it's just a tangled mess. At least this tangled mess that we see here is properly labeled. And finally, let's come back up top here. What is this? This is not for looks. The, the material? Yes. Th this material is called duvetine. And uh, I- Duvetine? Duvetine. Duvetine, yes, okay. D-U-V-E-T-E-N-E. -E. Okay. That's a strange, strange name. Um, you know, most of my career was spent in the entertainment business. Uh -huh. And this material is a, it's a fire retardant material that's used to black out studios, uh, block windows. Uh, it's to create blackness. Got it. So we did this um, for better resolution with the camera, right? It's not the resolution we're after, we're after contrast. Contrast. We want to be able to see um, the edges of this relative to anything else. Mm -hmm. So the original setup had um, th this rubber mat underneath, right. Right. and this rubber mat is black, mm -hmm. but it's also smooth and shiny. Mm -hmm. So the LEDs here are incident with the the camera. So mm -hmm. there's a camera right here. The LEDs are just barely offset. Mm -hmm. So if there's anything flat and reflective in front of it, all you see is the reflection of the LEDs. Right. That's it. And so when you have a block like this, you would see a big giant reflective spot here, mm -hmm. which creates a lens flare. Mm -hmm. And then what it, the, the lens flare is circular. So mm -hmm. you would it would look like this thing had these lobes coming out like this. It no longer looked like a rectangle. Yeah. And depending on what angle you're at, you might see one of those reflections on the, the mat that it was sitting on. So it was really hard to find the edges reliably. Sometimes it would work and sometimes it wouldn't. It kind of depends on that. Well, um, th that was one thing that I couldn't figure out. The Robot camera has been absolutely incredible. Every now and then it would not see the palette or it, it would see it. It just wouldn't identify it. There's no way that I could go back in and look at the snapshot and go, what did you identify? But that makes sense that if there were reflections that it saw a flare, we programmed it to look for rectangular objects, right. but instead it's seeing something, it's picking up edges that are round, uh, could have been a, a lens flare or something like that, or even just the gloss from this. Now we did scuff this down, but it wasn't enough. Right, I tried to uh, to scuff it even more and it really wasn't even close. Mm -hmm. So, you know, kind of going back to my, um, uh, movie days uh, I went down to the logo you know, here in in the Los Angeles area yeah it's kind of you can go down to the store and buy this stuff but th this is available mail order for for anybody if they have a, you know a similar problem yeah um, now it's probably not going to wear well what is our thinking behind that it's definitely um, it'll definitely last long enough and is cheap enough that when this square is done and scuffed up or torn has holes torn in mm -hmm. it the minimum that that we can buy this in is 54 inches wide and five yards mm -hmm. long 
Okay. So we have quite a bit of this um, on a, you know, for $50, I think is what it was. So to your point, when this runs its course, some might say in the comments section, what a waste of money because you're throwing this stuff and you're replacing it. But what you are not considering is that we got months, maybe even a year of reliable process with 100% uh, part identification because of this material. Absolutely, yeah, the, yeah. the goal, and it, it, this has you know, been my primary focus, is how to make this thing identify the part perfectly 100% of the time. Mm. And then you machine this, you came in on a weekend when we weren't running production, you machine right. this. Um, it's just, this is a welded steel table. It feels like it's about an eighth inch, maybe a hundred, hundred thousandths thick. Yeah. We were anticipating that it might have some wobble, so we put it on a nice thick piece of half inch thick Mike Six tooling plate with standoffs. So now it goes under and yeah. out the back, which right. is really cable, nice. Right, the cable the cables feed straight through the the center. Yeah, and this de definitely went a long way towards keeping it rigid. Because mm. as strong as the table seems um, on the surface, when when the robot is relatively heavy, but when it when it reaches out with a heavy pallet. Uh -huh. um, it's gonna bend like this. This table is flexing. And so when is it gonna be reaching out? It's gonna be reaching out when it needs to drop something off in a precision location right. in, the, in there. That's what we don't so, want. And that flex would be different between this size and the larger size. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, I think we'd be chasing our tails. Yeah. Uh, um, the same reason you want a rigid CNC machine, you want a rigid robot base. So it looks like you set up some test targets here. Can I give you the control <laughs> and you, yeah. you run it? Yeah, yeah. Now, now, by the way, I may have moved this, so it may not be close, but so you, you programmed it to dr pick it up, identify it, pick it up, drop it off, and then you put tape and then repeat in different orientations, right? right? So the process reliability is the, the most important thing. And I want to make sure it can identify wherever this is and put it in a consistent location. Consistent location. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's see how we do. The first thing it's going to do is go to a, a standard position where it will take a photo of the, the work piece, mm -hmm. figure out how it's oriented on the table. It's gonna go down and, and pick it up in the proper orientation. Mm. At this point, the robot knows exactly where it's starting from, and it also knows where it's, it's gonna end. So now it's gonna go down until it feels the table. So it can actually sense when it um, gets to the table. And as soon as it senses that, it lets it go. So it's going down and feeling for a, a force or a resistance. Correct. Once it hits a threshold, then it just goes home. Correct. So that, I, I adjust it. Let's, let's move this just another random spot. Uh, we'll put it there and see how it does. All right, let's do it. Took its photo. Photo, identifying, goes down. Found the center. And it's it. also going for force. Yep. When it reaches that force threshold, stop, turn on the vacuum. Yep. That's exactly what it does. And again, searching for the bottom of the table through force. And by the way, we're using um, the force co pilot from Robotique, which gives a lot of flexibility. Okay, it put it down. It's looking fantastic. One more. How about one more? Yeah, let's do one more. Let's do it. I, I don't know if we have. Yeah, something like, like that. Like 90 degrees, something like that. Yeah, clearly not a precision location. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that's the most important part. Yeah, and keep in mind, we roll up a cart of pallets stacked mm -hmm. like where you're at, and they're pretty much going to be in the same orientation each time. Yeah. So this is a very extreme example. Yeah, the purpose of the precision here is so that the robot is capable of putting it into a precise location in the machine. That's right. We don't have to probe each part. Yeah. This is essentially the work holding solution in the machine. Correct, yeah. yeah, that's what this location would be. Yeah. And that's pretty consistent. It is. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. So it's a success. Okay, the robot is fully programmed. It's set up, got two carts with material on them. All we need to do is press start on both the control and the robot.
we've made incredible progress dialing in this robot to make our pallets. So what's next? Dual grippers from Robotique, ultimate machine tending. We're gonna set that up on our lathe next. Now, if you liked that last portion, I also have some bonus content. I'm gonna put a card down there and check the description so that you can see me narrate step by step exactly what this robot is doing. And if you haven't already done so, consider subscribing to catch more of this robot action, as well as our Pearson Fixture Friday series. Until next time, go innovate your production.